Good morning. My name is Brad Cosgrove, and my wife Vicky and I, with our kids, have been coming here for over five years now. And uh, I'm very excited for you to be here this morning to listen to Billy's awesome message and just have this time to center yourself for the weekend. So, excuse me, for the week. So, have a great day. Go, Phils. Go, Birds. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Let's stand. All the praise belongs to our Lord. We're going to sing out to Him this morning all the good that He has done. He is worthy of what we can give back to Him this morning. you're doing this morning we stop and remind ourselves that you are so good we praise your name this morning because of it amazing love that welcomes me the kindness of
those words can be hard to sing With all the weighty things that happen in this world but when we pause long enough we remember when you have been there
sing that with me. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made. Oh, I will sing of the goodness. sweet it is how sweet it is Lord thank you for your presence thank you that it's in your presence we can't always explain it but there's a peace there's a comfort we get to feel that we can't feel anywhere else with anyone else you bring something so special that when we don't have it we yearn for it You are good. You long for us to know that. Father, this morning we submit, we lay down any pre-existing expectations and thoughts that we had about your goodness and we say, Lord, show us, truly show us. Because possibly we're defining good wrong. I have breath in my lungs. We are breathing here together. We are singing, our hearts are beating. That is good. Thank you, Father, for those moments of clarity that in this very moment you are with us. We are ready to hear your word. We are ready to embrace your truths. May your Holy Spirit do what only it can do, and that's help us see you fully and clearly. Thank you for sending Jesus, who was the perfect example of your love for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may have your seats. Hey, good morning, everybody. We are in the middle of a series called In the Wind, and the whole reason I titled this series In the Wind is because I have a book coming out at the end of this month called In the Wind, and it's really written for people who are searching, who are trying to figure out this whole idea of spirituality and what it is, and I'm really trying to point everybody to, to Christ. And, and so um, that's that. But In the Wind is actually a... Um, kind of a metaphor that I think is really good for the metaphor that, that we use for God, who is invisible, but we see him move. Just like wind is invisible, but we see it move and we see it, well, we don't really see it move, we see what it does. You know what I mean? And so that's the whole idea behind this, because I really believe that God is using everyday things to get our attention. And, and I really believe that he's using all kinds of things to get our attention, including what we're going to talk about today. So, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times, actually in the past couple months, you might remember that I, I've done a couple of different series on going through difficult times and difficulties and hardships. As a matter of fact, in September, we talked about the hardships of Joseph. And a couple months back, we talked about what to do with what you feel. And I went through a couple different psalms because, man, it's really important that we identify what we feel and, and go to God with those things. And so what do you do with those things? And you read the psalms, you get some perspective. Because, listen, man, we talk about going through hard times because it's necessary. Because life can be very hard. Because there are difficulties that you and I go through that we have to process, that we have to grab hold of. God, what are you doing here? And so we learn in the hard times that God is not absent. He's actually present and he's growing your faith and doing something in your life through the hard times. We know that to be true. But today, I want you to know something that God also gets your attention in the good times. 
in, in, in the things that you go through in life that you deem as, man, that was awesome, that was great, that was good. God is also using those things to get your attention. You know, I mean, I've often heard, you know, God speaks loudly in the bad times, but I always say God shows off in the good times. And so when you have the bad things going on in your life, you know God is speaking. You know God is trying to get through to you something specific, and he's doing it loudly. But man, when you have good things going on in your life, God's just showing off. And so we're going to talk today about blessings. And, and what are blessings? And when we receive them, how do we know that we're blessings? And what does it look like? Because I really believe when God does that, it points us to him. Blessings are something that is bestowed upon us. It is goodness and it is favor bestowed upon us. And we can often attribute that bestower as God. And that's the point. That when a blessing comes to us and we say thanks and we say awesome, and, and it, where, where does the thanks go? Blessings point us to God. And sometimes we run such a fast-paced life and we run from one thing to the next and we're accomplishing goals and we're getting a lot done, but we, we don't slow down enough to see the blessings and we don't slow down enough to see the good things and we don't slow down enough to see and think and thank. And it's really, really hard when you're moving so fast because there's so many blessings. Man, there's the blessings of people. Man, just, just, let's just, for example, a mom makes dinner for a daughter who comes home for the weekend, and both people are blessed. Kids sit around dad when he happened to be at the hospital watching the TV on the, on the screen just, just to be there with each other, and everybody's blessed. A teacher says to a student, hey, you know what? You've got a lot of promise ahead of you, and both people are blessed. An EMT kneels beside you at the worst time of your life, and you're blessed. You know what I mean? People top the list of blessings. If I were to ask you, you know, what are the biggest blessings in your life? People are going to top the list. But it's not just people because there are blessings all around if we just slow down and we take a look and we notice what God is doing and, and, and all the blessings he gives. Look, it could be a sunset on the bay or a sunrise on the ocean. It could be a rose bush, bush that you thought was dead and all of a sudden out comes a rose. It could be that you see a homeless person and you're like, man, I wish I could give them something. I just feel like I want to give them. And all of a sudden you find $10 in your pocket. These are all blessings. You know what a really good blessing is? You, you, you go by the convenience store and right on the window it says free coffee today. Yes. Like all these things, man. When you look at them in a good perspective, man, these are all blessings. Because blessings kind of spark something in us. And when we experience a blessing with our five senses we understand that a blessing comes to us and we understand what that looked like and it's going to be different for everybody in every situation but when we when we start thinking that way and it sparks in us there's something that goes beyond our five senses into something else that we just feel and it's a little hard to describe and you start to feel this thing like man that was god and when we don't attribute it to God, it's a, it, God uses it to point to himself. So when we say wow or awesome or thanks, it points to him. I remember the first missions trip that I took to the senior high students in many, many, many years ago. Um, we went to Guatemala, and a couple things that we did uh, for that period of time was we were going to work with an orphanage, and we were going to help you know, rebuild some of, of, of the orphanage. We were going to put on these kids' camps, health clinics, and uh, man, and just visit different um, villages and put on like a church service for them. And it was just great. It was, it was a really amazing time. We walked into one village and it was about sundown. And all the houses in this village were basically made out of concrete block, just stop, stop, stockpiled on each other. There was no door, there was no window, it was just all kind of open air. There were so many chickens going in and out of the house. Um, it looked like one of those time lapses of the New York subway, you know, just chickens in, out, in, out, in, out. You know, it's just really amazing. The kitchen was no more than a campfire set on the corner of the house, and so it was really smoky inside, and, and the people didn't have much, and it was, but it was awesome. And, and so, so we were walking through the village, and all of a sudden, this man jumps out of the, of the doorway with a cowboy hat on and a tin cup, and he yells, Cafe! 
And I was like, this dude really likes coffee, man. You know, he, maybe he just poured himself a cup of coffee and he's so happy. But actually what it was, was what the guy who was with us was saying to us, hey man, he's inviting anybody in for coffee. And I'm like, I'm all ears at this point. And the guy's like, but, but I don't know if I would do that because the water's not great around here. I'm like, yo, I'm taking that chance. Let, let's go get some coffee. So I took about a half dozen other people with me, walked in the house, and we all had coffee together. And he poured coffee for all of us in these tin cups that were a little bit rusty, mostly from the humidity and probably years of hospitality. And we drank coffee together. And it was an amazing thing I'll never forget. I didn't know their language. I didn't know how to speak Spanish. I know very little. And they didn't know how to speak English. But we all had coffee together, and their family was sitting there, chickens running around everywhere, a half dozen of us, and we just just made eye contact the whole time, smiled, and we just, all of us, without even saying it, we're like, this is such a blessing. I love people, man. And when you have an experience like that, that you just knew that it was a blessing, it was an amazing blessing. And one of the things that I noticed about these people who didn't have much, okay, was the joy and gratitude that they exuded about just having us in their house. They were so thankful, so joyful, so honored that we would come in and have some coffee with them and, and you know, kind of tip cups with each other and just have a great time and smile. But their whole life exuded this joy. And their whole life exuded not just a joy, but a gratitude. Because, listen, man, listen, when you have joy and you have gratitude together, if you can discipline yourselves to live a life of gratitude, that is going to be a game changer no matter what you're going through. It is absolutely going to be a game changer. And you have mixed that with joy, and all of a sudden, it all kind of turns into this feeling inside that you are being blessed. And that points you to God. And this whole lifestyle that we should live of, of understanding and noticing blessings when they come, and this whole idea of living a life of gratitude, is, it's all combined, man. Gratitude, blessing, gratitude, blessing. It's sort of like two people on a track team. You run around and you have to hand a baton. So if gratitude is running around the track and you're thankful and you're thankful and you're thankful, and then all of a sudden you hand a baton to blessing, you realize, man, this was a blessing. I was so thankful, and now I'm understanding that it's a blessing. And blessing runs around the track, and, ble and you start to be thankful because you're being blessed by God, and so you get the baton back, and it's just back and forth. Gratitude, blessing, gratitude, they go together. They're intertwined. And so when we say, wow, and we say thanks, who gets the thanks? I'm always interested when people are saying, I'm so thankful, because I'm always interested of who you're thankful to because thanks always has to have an object. If you're going to give thanks, where is the thanks going? Because it always has to have an object. And so that is what God uses to point to himself. And so I think living a life of blessing and living a life of gratitude, man, it's just a game changer in, in our whole demeanor and our whole outlook on life. Now, I want to explore that a little bit and just talk about what is a blessing and how does it work and how does God use it? And so I'm going to start with the profile of a blessing. The profile of a blessing. You know what a profile is? It's the look, it's the configuration, it's the lines of something it's the characteristics of someone that help you identify that someone, okay? And we often use the word profile as a verb, and so that we, we profile somebody. No kidding. This was, this was like, I think it was February of last year. It was really dark. It was really cold. And I had to go to that Wawa on a Sunday morning at around 4.15 because I had a lot of work to do on, on the sermon. It was, it, was, it was one of those weeks that I just needed to do a few touch-up things. So I got to that Wawa at about 4.15, the one on Green Hill Road. And I know, man, I had this old coat on, and it was kind of unbuttoned, kind of buttoned like this, and my hair was a complete mess because I had taken a shower and laid on it. I didn't do anything to it. I have my gel in the office. I'll deal with that later, okay? So I walk in this Wawa, at 4.15, and the cashier just kind of stares at me the whole way I go to the coffee, right? And so I, I was just kind of stared back a couple times, so it made it awkward right away. I'm staring, he's staring, I'm staring, he's staring, right? Another employee comes over to him over by the cash register. Now they're both staring at me while I'm going to get my coffee. It was, 
it was comical. I'm like, man, what's going on? So, but, but it made it real awkward because I kept staring back, right? And then a third employee came over and stood with them. And then he's the one that ended up saying, excuse me, sir. I'm like, who are you talking to? Are you talking to me? <laughs> like, this is like 4.15. I'm the only one in there. So all of a sudden, it's getting really weird. Can I help you, sir? And I'm like, uh, not, not unless you can preach a sermon for me this morning. You know what I mean? And then I got my coffee, and I kind of walked out, and it was just awkward. They 100% thought I was going to steal or rob the place. I'm telling you the truth. 100%. It was the most awkward thing, but that's what happens, man, when, when somebody unnecessarily judges or profiles. And, and so you understand that the profile is a characteristic, the profile is a configuration, the profile is the shape of something. I want to give you the shape of a blessing. What I mean is, there is a foundational point to a blessing, and there's a biblical foundation and, and, and an idea to, that we can use to understand really what a blessing is, first and foremost. What is a blessing? And so we're going to look at a profile of a blessing. Before I do, <clears throat> we're going to be in the book of Numbers. Let me explain the book of Numbers. It's in the Old Testament. It is a whole book on the wilderness journey as the Israelites were moving to the promised land. We call it the book of Numbers because that's what it's titled in the English Bible. And so it's called Numbers because there was a whole lot of counting. They were counting people. They were counting clans. They were counting animals. Everything was being counted, and so we call it Numbers. But in the original Hebrew Bible, and even in the Hebrew Bible today, they always title books of the Bible, okay, by the first sentence of that book in the Hebrew language. And the first sentence of the book of Numbers is actually, actually uses a couple words, in the wilderness. So the Hebrew Bible calls that book in the wilderness, which is really appropriate because it's the whole story of the Israelites from start to finish moving toward the promised land. Now what's really interesting is that word for wilderness, if you, if you take that word and make it a verb, those same three co Hebrew consonants form the word speak. And so there's always been a little bit of a study with scholars to say, why is the same root for wilderness the same root for speak? And I think part of the reason is, is because God speaks in the wilderness. And so when these Israelites are just about to take this journey that is going to be, number one, difficult, and it's going to be, number two, confusing as to what happens, and they're going to do a whole lot of complaining, and God is going to do a whole lot of, i got to teach you a lesson, a whole lot of this. They're about to begin the journey. What do they need? What do the Israelites need more than anything else to begin this journey? Do you know what they need? A blessing from God. That is the number one thing that they need in the beginning of this journey. And honestly, it's the number one thing we need when we begin a journey. It's the number one thing we need when we start into this area of confusion or, or some kind of difficulty or something that we're, we know is just going to be hard for a long time. What do we need more than anything else? We need a blessing from God. And so in the book of Numbers... In the very beginning, after all the counting's done, right at the very beginning, we have a blessing. And this blessing is one of the most famous and used blessings all over the world in history. Let me read it. Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Now, let me, let me show you this passage in the New King James Version because I think this is more familiar to what you guys probably are used to. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This is the foundational blessing of all blessings. And so if you want to know the profile of what a blessing is, you look at this, and this is going to give you an idea of what all blessings are based on. Now what's interesting is, Hebrew writers, when they would write blessings or when they would write things that they are learning from God, David did this all the time in the Psalms, they would employ a lot of tools in their poetry. 
And one of the tools that they employ is called parallel poetry. There's many, but this is one of the most common in the Bible, where one line is going to be kind of describing another line and is going to kind of be describing another line in parallel fashion so you get a better idea of what really is going on. And so if you look at lines 1, 3, and 5, it says, May the Lord bless you. May the Lord smile on you. May the Lord show you his favor. And so right away, because of the parallel poetry, we say that, man, here's what a blessing of God is. A blessing of God is when he smiles on you and he shows you his favor. That is a very personal thing. That is a very individual. He is smiling at you and showing you his favor. And that's really the basis of a blessing. And the outcome of a blessing is always going to be lines 2, 4, and 6. It says, protect you, be gracious to you, give you his peace. And so when it says God is keeping us, like it said in the other passage, and you talk about this whole idea of protection, it's because of his grace you know, moving toward you because of his grace. And it says that he is going to give you his peace. And peace is always part of the Hebrew blessing. As a matter of fact, the word shalom is their greeting, but it is also a blessing. And the word shalom for us, believe it or not, means nothing missing, nothing broken. And so when somebody comes to you and says shalom, they're saying to you, nothing missing, nothing broken for you and your family and your loved ones. That's, that's the basis of a blessing. And when we start out on any journey that we have to take and we have anything going on in our lives, what do we need more than anything else? We need to know that, man, the Lord blesses us. He protects us. He's smiling on me. He's gracious. He, he's going he's to show me his favor. He's going to give me his peace. And that's, that's what's, that is the blessing on you. That, that's really powerful. And it points to God. It is something that points us to God. Listen, you know, um, many of you have used a compass, right? Everybody used a compass? It took me a long time to learn how a compass works, but, but that's, you know, you got this little red needle that you love seeing float around, and man, I'm not so great at it. I just let the needle go where it goes, and, and somebody else can tell me which direction, right? But a compass is a compass, and it's kind of cool. And I always thought to myself, I wonder when, how was this invented? Because people don't just find a needle and balance it on another needle and hold it in a tin thing of glass on top. Like, how, who invented this and who discovered, I guess, is what you want to say. And when you do a little research, you realize that in the second century uh, BC, the Chinese uh, had something of a compass. And then when people were doing even more studies, they realized that the Mesoamerica, which is like the, the Aztecs and the Incas down in Mexico back in, at that time, a thousand years before that, discovered this because there's this stone called a lodestone, and it's magnetic. It's very, very highly magnetized, okay? And so somehow they must have put it on the table. It must have balanced itself. It must have been like a soup ladle they actually had upside down. All of a sudden, this thing started doing like this. And everybody freaked out. And they're like, man, look at this. Somebody come here. This is crazy. And they saw the spoon move or whatever that was. It was a weird object. And they saw it move. And that's why in the early days of the compass, way back then, it was more about divination than it was about navigation. Because they thought this is some weird, crazy thing, you know. And all of a sudden, we realize that, man, this, this is working, man. This is about navigation. We can use this. And, and all of a sudden, people develop these things that then point to true north. You know what? Blessings are like compasses. They delicately turn you to something that is real but invisible. There's no doubt about the power of the magnetic poles, there's no doubt about this magnetic pole of the earth that is going to draw your needle on the compass to, to point to it. But it's invisible. That's what blessings do, man. When you have something come upon you, you realize that it's a blessing from God. It points you to him. Let's talk about the promise of a blessing. I'm going to go to um, the New Testament now, the promise of a blessing. Let's talk about Jesus for a minute. Jesus, in the beginning of his ministry was about to preach the most 
profound sermon that he had preached up to this point is going to be the longest sermon and is going to end up being the most famous sermon that he has ever preached. Now, right before he's preaching this, I was starting to put myself into Jesus' shoes and, and trying to figure out, okay, Jesus is fully God, okay? But he's also fully man. So the man part of him, how, how did he develop the sermon? Because there were so many things that he had to talk about in the sermon. There's a lot of difficult things, a lot of great things, but a whole lot of difficult things that were going to be very challenging to the people. How is he going to start this message? And I'm sure he thought about it for some time, so I could start with some commands, I could start with reading some scripture, I could quote some of this, I could do this. And I think he thought to himself, you know what the people need? They need a blessing. Do you know why they need a blessing? Because here's Jesus on the scene, talking to all these people. He's at the beginning of his ministry, and they're about to take a journey with Jesus. Just like the Israelites were about to take a journey through the wilderness, these people were going to be about to take a journey. What do you need right before a journey? When you know a journey is going to be difficult, when you know a journey is going to last a long time, what do you need? You need a blessing. You need a blessing from God. That's what you need. And so Jesus... The very beginning of the book of Matthew starts out in Matthew chapter 5 with blessings. It's the very beginning of this whole Sermon on the Mount. Very beginning. And we call it the Beatitudes. Now, Beatitude just means supreme blessing or supreme happiness. That's just a, a, a Latin kind of way of, of saying supreme blessing, supreme happiness. Some of your versions might even say instead of blessed are, you're going to see um, happy are. Because those words were interchangeable. But here's, here's, here it is. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And there he lays out blessing after blessing after blessing. He doesn't leave out anybody. Because all of this is open to everybody who is listening. These are blessings and these are promises. These are both. And so Jesus begins this most important sermon, and he's saying, you know what, we're going to begin this whole thing with the idea of being blessed. And he says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. We understand what's going on inside of us, and there's nothing we can do to help that. We understand the ugliness that is inside of us. We understand the ugliness that is in the world. And as people that realize that, man, we, we got to have God, man, this is the only way, there's only hope. We've got to have God. They're blessed people. God blesses those who mourn. And when people are mourning in mourning about the grief that other people experience, the grief that you experience, the evil that's in the world, and when we mourn all of that, and God's like, there's going to be a blessing for you because you're going to be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, which means God blesses those who count everybody else first and me second. Like, it's, it's counterintuitive for a lot of people, but man, when you say to yourself, I'm going to put them first, and me second, God is saying you're going to receive a blessing. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, those who don't forget about the forgotten, because there are so many forgotten people in this world. There are forgotten people in your neighborhood. There are forgotten people in your cities. There are forgotten people all over the place. And when we don't forget and that there is justice and that there is a need for, for this, this idea of justice and people hunger and thirst for that, to do the right things for the right reasons so that everything functions the right way, God is saying, that's going to be a blessing. God blesses those who are merciful. So when you feel sorry for somebody and you actually put feet and hands on that feeling sorry for somebody and you're actually doing something to, to, to show that person mercy, you are going to be blessed. God blesses those whose hearts are pure. I love this one. This is the hardest one because we know that nobody can, can actually attain the, uh, a complete 100% purity of heart. Can't. 
The only way we can have a, a, a pure heart is through the forgiveness and the washing of our, our sins away through Christ on the cross and his blood and resurrection for the victory over sin and darkness and death. That's the only way we know how to be pure. But when our hearts are directed to purity, when we are living lives that we are making an effort to live in holiness and purity of God, it says we'll see him. I really believe that people whose morals and hearts are, are, God, I just want to do what you want me to do. And I know I struggle. And I know I'm not perfect. And I mess up all the time. But God, I want to see you. And I believe that those people who are working at that are going to see a different side of God. And they're going to see God work like other people won't. I really believe that. God, God blesses those who work for peace. And when we look at all of the things going on in the world, it's no wonder that, that God is, is putting a high priority on God blesses those who work for peace. There is so much division. There are so many sections. Everything seems like, it, you know, you've got to take a side, and, and, and it's just really, really getting to be a crazy place. And, and, and God's like, and Jesus is like, hey, man, God blesses those who work for peace. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. Yes. When we say we are doing a thing in the name of Jesus, when we stand up for the name of Jesus, when we stand up for what is right and wrong in the name of Jesus, there are a lot of people that are not going to like that. They're not going to like your decision to stand up against some moral thing. They're not going to like your decision to stand up for Jesus Christ. It's just going to be that way. And, and, and Jesus is making it clear that you're going to be blessed through this. And so this whole journey was about to start for them in this walk with Jesus, in this understanding who Jesus is. And Jesus is like, how about this? I'm going to start out with a blessing. All of you all have the opportunity to receive a blessing from God. And the foundation of that blessing is God saying, my face shines upon you. And I'm going to give you grace. Grace. And I'm going to give you all of that for this journey, and I'm never going to take it away. And then Jesus just specifically goes right down this, and he's like, wow, man, I would have loved to have been there for that. It's a promise. Let's talk third about the pattern of a blessing. The pattern. Okay. Um, I love looking at patterns, because patterns can often be templates, and I'm not saying that this one is a one-to-one is -one template because there's a lot of different ways to pattern a blessing, but this is one of the primary ways that you'll see in Scripture a blessing being patterned after. And so I'm going to turn to Mark chapter 10. And this is when Jesus blesses the children. Let's check this out. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them, but the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. Hey, man, I feel all that. You know, because, man, here's a group of parents who are saying, Jesus is going to be near to us. He's going to be in our town. He's going to be in our village. Let's take our children to get blessed by him because they either thought he was a prophet or maybe they even thought he was the Messiah. And so they're like, let's bring our children because he's going to pronounce a blessing on them. What do our children need when, when, when they start their journey? They need a blessing from God. And so let's take our children to Jesus. So all these people are around Jesus, okay? And they all have children. And all the children starting to scream and holler, play tag, laugh, giggle, pinch, pull hair, and all the things that children do when they're waiting in line, okay? And Jesus is loving every bit of it. And so the disciples are like, man, enough of this. And Jesus is like, hold on. You're about to miss the blessing. You're about to miss the blessing of children laughing and playing in the street. You're about to miss the blessing of parents bringing their kids to be blessed by me. You're about to miss it. That's what he's saying. And after a little bit of time and a few words, he took the children and he blessed them. Now, any time that we're dealing with children and you do the same thing, it's, it's, it's awesome because you hope the best for them. 
You have a little five-year-old kid, man, and is running around, it might be a neighbor, and what do you want for them? You want the best for them. Anytime you're, you're involved in children, anytime Jesus was going to bless the children, there was always something in that blessing about the future, because that's the way it always is when you're dealing with children. But you want them to have a blessed future. Man, I took a group of, of high school students on another summer in a missions trip, and we stayed almost two weeks in the city of Chester, and we lived uh, down there, lived, stayed there in the bottom of, like, of a, an old, um, old high school in that city that was being run by a nonprofit. Um, and so we stayed there, and we did a whole lot of things in the community, and one of the things that we did was we ran a kids' camp every day of the week, Right? And so we would gather a bunch of kids, and we'd have crafts, games, a Bible story. Uh, we'd have some time to pray, and then we'd have some more games and a whole lot of fun. But we had to get the word out. And so this park happened to be right in the middle of Highland Gardens. If you know anything about Chester, it's, it's really one of, one of the most um, crime-ridden, drug-infested, and a lot of gangs that live in Highland Gardens. And so we just, I just took some students over there, and we just walked around, knocked on doors, said, hey, we'd, we'd love your kids to come. It's going to happen from 9 to 12 every day. We can't wait. There's going to be food. There's going to be, you know, it's going to be a, an awesome time. And we walked around back, and there was a whole, literally a whole gang that was sitting in a circle. There's like about 14 or 15 of them, and they were sitting there, and you could tell by the markings and everything, and they kind of stared at us while we were walking over, and I was like, hey, man, check it out. Hey, guys, do you mind if I interrupt for a minute? Um, I got something to say about the children. I wanted to start with that, okay? I wanted to start with that. Um, we're having this awesome thing for the children. And man, you can bring all your kids, you can bring all of them you want, and we're going to have a great time. We're going to have, and I told them the crafts and the food and everything like that. And it was really awesome because every one of them smiled. Every one of them. And they're all like, oh, man, that's great, man. It's all about the children. It's all about the kids, man. We'll get the word out. And we had like 58 kids show up because they got the word out. I don't know if they threatened them. You better bring your kids there. I have no idea. Didn't care. We had 58 kids, right? Really, really cool. Because it is all about the children. So there's something about the children that makes us think about the future. You want a special future for that child. So let me go to another place where Jesus uh, blessed people. And, and, a, and we don't often think of it. It's in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 50. Then Jesus led them to Bethany, and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. I, man, every time I think of the ascension, okay, when Jesus rose from the dead, he spent 40 days doing ministry as a resurrected Jesus, and then he ascended into heaven. And I always loved this picture of what, what was going on at, that, at, at the moment of the ascension. He was blessing them, and in the middle of him blessing them, He's floating off into heaven. This is a trip, okay? This is wild. He didn't expect that. But I love the fact that the last thing Jesus did as he was on this earth was he was blessing. So let's go back into the story to kind of understand a little bit of the, this pattern that I'm talking about, okay? Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost, because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then the, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Then he said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. So here's Jesus 
They're thinking he's a ghost. So Jesus comes in bodily form and makes sure that they understand that he is not a ghost, even eats food. Ghosts, whatever he means by that, don't eat food, okay? And so obviously they believed when he started doing that. But what did he start with? In this interaction, he started with a blessing. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken with all of you disciples. And so he starts out this blessing, and then he starts going on and, and convincing them that, listen, man, all this had to happen, and this is all about the forgiveness of sins. And then we get to verse 49, which says, And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father has, had promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Now, this is loaded. This is packed. This whole passage of Scripture has included in it, and I'm going to include some of what we just read out of the larger portion of that Scripture, but this is what it's saying. That when Jesus is around, and Jesus is letting them know things that are very, very encouraging, that part of the blessing I really, really believe that Jesus was, do, was blessing them with as he was ascending into heaven had to do with five things had to do with his presence, had to do with a promise, had to do with power, had to do with prospect, which means a special future, and had to do with peace. I really believe that. When you look at this, it's all there. Let's look at his presence. Now I will send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Jesus in spirit form. So he's going to send his presence through the Holy Spirit. All through the book of John, he talked about sending the Holy Spirit. We talk about promise. It says, just as my father promised. And God's promises will never fail because they can never fail. And when we talk about his power, he says, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. And when we talk about prospect, just like you hear the word prospect in baseball, like they're the number one prospect, prospect it means that there's a special future attached to that person. Okay, and so the prospect is, I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Everything is written in the future tense. There's a very special future awaiting the disciples. It's going to have to do with the Holy Spirit. It's going to have to do with his presence, his promises, and his power, because, and that's why they have a special future. And then I'm going to go back to the very beginning of when he first introduced himself in this moment, and he said, peace be with you. I'm going to include peace. So, when we get to verses 50 and 51, it says, Then Jesus led them to Bethany, and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. And I wonder what he was saying. But based on what Jesus was just explaining to them, maybe the blessing was, I'm going to bless you all with the presence of God, and he will never leave you. I'm going to bless you all with the promises that will never fail. I'm going to bless you all with the power that you have access to. I'm going to bless you all with the prospect of a special future. I'm going to bless you with peace so that you can understand that with me, nothing will be missing. Nothing will be broken. I am a healer. I am a restorer. I'm going to bring things back together for you. And as, as, as he's floating into heaven, and he's hearing these things, and they're hearing these things, and they're like, man. And so verse 52 and 53, so they worshiped him and then returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy, and they spent all of their time in the temple praising God. It's almost like an automatic response. When you get a pronouncement of a blessing like that upon you, okay, the automatic response would be joy and praise and that's what they did. That's the only thing they could do. It's like, man, what, what Jesus was saying, they knew to be true. They saw all of it. They're starting to put together that he really was the Messiah. He was God. He's showing himself. He's, he's going into heaven just like it was prophesied. And it's like, man, he just pronounced to us a blessing. You know, um, there's nothing, nothing, like the nearness of God. And when we are blessed, there's nothing like a blessing that demonstrates the nearness of God. Because it's something that we 
can see or sense with our five senses is also something that we feel. And we're like, man, God, you are that good. You, you are that good to me when I am not that good to you. It's all a blessing, man. So, so you know what the blessing is for you? Do you know what the blessing that Jesus is, is pronouncing on you? It's that same blessing. No matter where you are in life, no matter what struggles you have, it's that same blessing. And what is that blessing? It's his presence, his promise, his power, the prospect of a special future, and peace. That is the blessing of Jesus upon all of you. That is the promise upon all of you. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Listen, I understand. Listen, I was reading a devotion yesterday morning. And, and, and one of the things that it said was, how do you make big life changes? Let's say you're somebody, you're like, man, I know I need to make some big changes in my life. How do you do it? You know what they said the answer was? It was really funny. Slowly and poorly. I totally get what they're saying. 100%. But the sentence right after that, she wrote, slowly and poorly, but every step is, as no matter how small it is of victory, Jesus is saying, yes, with his fist in the air. Those are blessings, man. And when we stop and we slow down and we look at our life and we understand, you know, what he's trying to do, it's like, man, he, he wants to pronounce that on you. The presence of God that will never go away. The promises that will never fail. The power that you will always have access to. The prospect of a hopeful, a wonderful, an amazing, and a special future. And peace be with you. Shalom. Nothing missing and nothing broken. And I'm going to take that a step further. I'm going to take that a step further. Listen, man. You, because you know the truth, can pronounce this on somebody else. Man, if you're ever in a crowd of people and you're at some party, some celebration, something or whatever, or, or somebody you really feel like needs a blessing, and, or, or they come up to you and say, hey, can you just say a blessing? Can you just pronounce a blessing? Can you say a prayer? And you're like, oh, man, I don't know what I'm doing. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because you just follow that pattern. And you get up in front of the people and you say, may the presence of God go with you because he'll never leave you. May the promises never fail, because they can never fail. May the power be at your disposal, because he offers it. May you have the prospect of a hopeful and special future. And may peace be with you. That's what Jesus says to every one of you sitting here. That's what Jesus says to every one of you watching online. That's the hope that we have and the blessing of God Almighty. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us many blessings. You, you bless us all the time. We just have to slow down, stop, and recognize it. And thank you for the many blessings that you give to us. And thank you for blessing us with, with your presence. You said you're always going to be with us. Thank you for blessing us with your promise that you say will never fail and your power that, that will never run out. Lord, the prospect of a special future, no matter who we are, where we are in life, and Lord, peace that goes along with it. May you continue to heal us, that we may live out to nothing missing, nothing broken. Thank you, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. Church, as always, thank you so much for gathering with us for worship today. You know, it's something I really love taking part in with all y'all. And I just want to remind you, as always, we have prayer available up front for those who need it. And I really would encourage you just to reach out and take advantage of this opportunity. And I want to remind you too, actually, that nearly every Sunday night, our Prayer Works Ministry meets here at church 630 in room uh, 102, 103. It's an amazing time to come out for prayer. And so I just encourage you guys, you're always invited. It's an open invitation from our Prayer Works team. Thank you too for your offering, you guys. You can give in the back online with the QR code. It really helps to make everything we're doing here possible. And one of those things that I just, I have to mention one last time is our fall block party. You guys have seen these flyers. You guys have heard us sharing about it. You've seen us online with Adam in our messages. It's something that 
I love this event. I'm so excited. It was an amazing time last year from everything from our moon bounces to our trunk retreats, which thank you to all of you who have signed up or have brought candy to help make this happen. There's still room to sign up. There's still time to bring candy. So thank you all for the parts you're playing in that because it really is going to make an amazing impact, an amazing event. But we're not done there. Take a moment. Take a flyer. And just take this opportunity that we all have to just extend the invitation. I know there's someone in your life that maybe is a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, a family member, someone that you could just say, hey, come on out. It's going to be an amazing time. They're going to have everything from hay rides to the moon bounces to the trunk retreat. It's going to be great. So I can't wait to see you guys next week. Also, have a great week. Thank you for joining us. I'll see you guys. Bye-bye.